Uh, so, uh, the, the point of this talk is basically uh, how to integrate your storage systems uh, with Docker uh, as, as, the, uh, um, as both a container engine and as well as an orchestration system, the, some of the stack on top of Docker. Um, if, you, uh, if, if you, just a quick background, uh, Docker, versus, uh, Docker Swarm and Up versus Kubernetes and Mesos. Um, they, uh, Kubernetes and Mesos have slightly different, ha have, well, they have a different plugin system for volumes at least. So if you want to use persistent storage uh, and tie that into Kubernetes or Mesos, that is not for this discussion. Both great systems. We, but we love both, but um, it's a different plugin system. And so the technical side of this is going to be focused specifically on how to integrate with Docker Engine and the stuff and, and the Docker products that live on top of the stack. So, um, how many you, how many uh, of, of folks in the audience are familiar with containers, concepts of it? Oh, good, about three quarters. So I can go pretty quickly through this part of things. Um, containers basically, um, a lot of people think of them as lightweight VMs. They're not really. It's just you know basically one process with some lightweight management um, on top of that process uh, from the kernel uh, in a particular C group or whatever to keep uh, that that process's uh, resources locked out from the rest of the system. A um, uh, couple of things fundamental that that, that I want to go over before we get deeper into this: uh, containers start with an image, uh, which is. All which ideally, in, in in the super best perfect world of all perfect worlds, in the container side of things, that container's image consists of only the files that you need to actually run your application and nothing more. Um, in reality, it doesn't work that way. Most folks start with the base OS image uh, that is a stripped down uh, version of, of some operating system, whether it's a, a Linux distribution or uh, or, or a lightweight. Uh, uh, distribution of Windows, um, although the Windows lightweight distributions are still 10 gigs. Um, it's true. Um, but, but ideally, you want to you make it as small as possible. And you, uh, f if for no other reason, then it's a lot easier to throw the container image around. But also, it, it's, it also it's, a, it's a disciplinary thing of encouraging uh, your developers and your engineers to not throw a bunch of stuff in that container that, the cont that is not the container's responsibility. You may want to add a few other things. Uh, just if you ever need to, if you ever need to watch processes going inside the container, if you need to log in and poke around, you may want BusyBox or some kind of lightweight, uh, you know, way to do that. But keep it light and easy. Um, so uh, that's kind of the image part, and then execute uh, the, the execute pipeline is just your init process, how you kick off the how you kick off the process that's happening in the container, and then uh, and, and again from the uh, from the Container engine side, uh, the, your C groups and namespaces, um, and we generally want to operate with the principle of least responsibility, just to make sure that you know you don't give access to that you don't need. So, um, and I probably jumped the gun on this particular slide, um, but a couple things here. Uh, by default, containers write into a running instance of their system image. Uh, so, if you need to write something to disk in a container, it's going to write it into that image. Uh, that image is also ephemeral. It's going to go away when the container dies. If that process dies, then Docker as a container engine will actually uh, completely uh, forget everything that you have written to that image. Yes? Does that mean the image is resident RAM? Um, depends, on, depends on your graph driver. We'll talk about that in a little bit. But in, in, uh, in, uh, in, in many cases, that is the case. Um, a lot of times that a lot of times the image will get flushed to disk uh, occasionally, but the right layer is often uh, is often persistent in RAM until it flushes. Um, so, um, network access uh, for the process that's running inside that container is specified at runtime. So, if you need to, if it, when you run it when you run a container um, and that that container needs uh, needs to have a port needs to have an ingress port, you specify that when it runs. Um, and uh, and the application and the assumption is that um, an application is normally not one container. It's a group of containers running um, in concert to deliver this to, to deliver uh, whatever it is that you're doing. Classic three tier Linux application example of, of WordPress. You got your web server. Um, generally running some type of PHP execution engine built inside of it as one tier. You've got a, your database as a second tier, and if you're gonna and if you're gonna scale that out, then uh, then above that you've got a load balancer. Um, those are three different 
those will be three different instances of containers. And if you're having multiple, uh, m multiple uh, um, web servers, then you would have several copies of that running. Um, that would be that whole collection is your application. Again, contain this is containers one or two here. Um, the uh, and generally that's managed by some kind of orchestration layer, whether it's Docker Swarm, Kubernetes, Mesos, or or something else. And there's there's a few others out there, and who knows what's going to happen uh, three years from now. So, but that's kind of the concept. So, getting back, getting specifically to Docker storage, there's three types of storage uh, systems under the hood in Docker. The first is registry storage, which is the cold storage of your container image. Uh, this is this is your container image at rest. Uh, it's essentially a library of where your container images are going to be stored before they get pushed out to an individual Docker uh, uh, individual Docker engine running your uh, that gets running that's actively running your container. Uh, the second type is your graph storage, which will in uh, inside Docker we call it a, is your graph driver. This is the active uh, storage engine running your live container image. We'll go dive a little bit deeper into that in just a little bit. But basically, once you say Docker run and hit the button, then what happens is the container's image gets moved from your registry into into your local Docker host, uh, and it'll be it's just a file on disk that uh, that uh, basically Docker uses to uh, um, as your disk image. And then anything anything that gets written to that disk gets written as a diff layer, and we'll go into that in a little bit. And then finally, uh, persist your volume uh, volume storage, which is this is your persistent file layer. If you're running something that, if you're running a, a process that needs to be able to persist that data, it needs to not be uh, it needs to not be ephemeral. Then you use your volume storage, and it's a separate subsystem. Uh, and uh, that's probably in the volume system is the biggest part of this talk. Um, but we're going to go into all three of them. So this particular diagram I'm going to be referring to several times during the talk. Um, to give you an idea of what basically what this what this is, this is essentially a three-node Docker cluster uh, with a bunch of different uh, storage uh, storage systems uh, plugged up. So um, inside inside the green boxes, those are your actual Docker uh, hosts. Um, you've got um, you got a volume driver and a graph driver. Uh, running inside, uh, running inside each each host as a subsystem, and then the registry is actually. If you're assuming you're running Docker Trusted Registry, the Docker's um, official registry system, uh, it's actually running as a container. So the square box, the the, the rectangular boxes in there are actually contain, running containers. So the registry system, if you're running all the default Docker tools, Docker Registry is actually just a series of containers. It's its own application running inside your Docker host. Um, so, talking about the specific registry storage, um, let's go back to the diagram real quick. Um, if you look up uh, under the, your cloud-based object storage uh, and attached to that as your registry backing store, um, that's the concept that we're going to go with for here. So, your Docker registry stores your container images like we discussed, runs as a container underneath Docker Engine. Again, for Docker's open source and commercial registry, there are third-party registries available that work just fine. One of the fundamental philosophies of Docker as, as a company and the tools that we produce is batteries included but not required. We want to provide a good standard default for anybody who wants to do stuff without tinkering. But if you want to tinker, if you have particular needs, that you, uh, then we're totally open and welcome for the community to provide so, to provide those. So, um, but in, in specific here, we're talking about Docker Registry or Docker Trusted Registry, which is the uh, that's the commercial version. Um, your config data uh, for registry is stored in under standard Docker volumes. We'll talk about that when we get back to uh, when we talk about persistent storage. Uh, the images are stored via via a driver that's specified when you create you know, when, when you launch your registry application. The two fundamental drivers are a native file system. Um, we don't really care what's underneath that. Um, it's it's basically going to be uh, uh, it's going to be in varlib Docker somewhere. Um, so you want if you want if you're going to be using the native file system and you want to persist all of those images. Um, then you want to have some type of uh, SAN or uh, storage or area network or network attached storage plugged into your Docker hosts to make sure that that's kind of persistent somehow. Uh, whether it's NFS, we don't care. Um, but attached remote storage is better for this if you're going to be going that route. Otherwise, you can plug it into a, uh, an object storage system, um, S3 Swift, 
um, GCS is object store, um, is we support S3 and Swift APIs out of the box. And so as long as you're plugging into something that has either one of th that can talk either one of those APIs, we work, uh, we work fine either way. Most object stores these days talk S3. Um, and if don't, if they don't talk S3, they, they talk Swift. Um, it's not really a whole lot of heavy lifting required to integrate your, your system to this. Um, you either, uh, you either mount a volume on, um, amount of volume on, on each Docker host and write to it, or you use an object store. And that's pretty much it. So, uh, we talked about, so that was the, that was the registry, uh, uh, backing up to, uh, the cloud-based object store in this particular case. Um, in this particular case, the, um, we're using, uh, we're, we're using some type of an object store. We've got a, a blue optional line from the backing storage system, which is just some type of big uh, file or block object storage. Um, in this particular diagram, I'm not going into specifics because it doesn't matter. Uh, so now we're actually going to talk about um, the graph driver. So the graph driver is, um, this is again, your containers running in motion. Um, the uh, graph driver by default writes to your local file system when it flushes the disk. Um, it can be backed by network storage, the same way as your same way as your registry if you want to do that. Um, don't really recommend it unless your network storage is very performant. Um, if you're running um, if you're running thousands of containers in the system, um, that's potentially a, a, a huge amount of I/O, especially if you're running um, a bunch of legacy applications that do a bunch of logging and writing to disk. Um, that can push a lot of I/O. Uh, into those into those images, and the graph driver is not really meant for a whole lot of writes. Um, uh, it, it's the whole idea is uh, th these are really really lightweight. We do copy on write to create a diff layer, um, and that's all of the graph drivers typically are copy on write to create a diff layer. Uh, the diff layers are removed from the containers deleted, and we leave the original file on disk uh, to make it easy to uh, to fire up another container when you're done. Um, did you have a question? Okay. Um, so um, the link down here is a uh, link to our uh, documentation about that. We have a handful of uh, built-in graph drivers, um, starting, with, um, starting with AUFS, which is our preferred driver, and then it drives, and then there's a cascading list of drivers from there if your system's not, uh, can't handle AUFS. Um, the, most of our, our, our newer graph driver systems are very dependent on kernel features. So, um, and most of those are, are at least Linux 4.1, uh, if not 4.3. So, um, if you're running on a if you're running on a system uh, that, say you've got a you've got a customer who's running um, Red Hat six, uh, that's their that's their blessed image that their IT their corporate IT says this is what you can run, and there are still shops that do that. Um, then, um, then like, you have to talk them. You have to sweet talk them into um, blessing a blessing a, a, a kernel, a newer kernel for those systems, because otherwise your graph driver storage is going to be really, really, really badly performant. Um, you really don't want to use our device mapper driver in, in anger um, for anything of any kind of volume. <laughs> you just don't. Um, so that's that's the fundamentals of the graph driver. Uh, we do have uh, we do have a, a plugin API for a graph driver. Um, it's currently an experimental uh, status. We have uh, one third-party vendor that's written a graph driver for it, um, which is uh, Portworx has a their uh, they, they call it LCFS. Um, it's it's a fuse-based driver that's really really fast, but they're not quite ready for uh, wanting people to use it in production. But feel free to test it; it works pretty well. And all of this is on the Linux side of things. Um, on Windows, it works a little bit different. Uh, plugin Docker plugins on Windows. Um, you have to use our older version of plugins for Windows. Uh, the newer plugin uh, spec, which we'll talk about in a little bit, is dependent on um, being able to containerize the plugins and being able to elevate permissions of those plugins to where they have less than root but more than a regular container. Um, and that, that fine grained permission system is not yet available in Windows to Docker. So. Uh, you have to use kind of the old school uh, way of just installing the plugin manually on the system, and 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 specifying your permissions at that point um, locally. So that's the one problem there. So the meat of this um, is with volume storage. Um, this is where your persistent data lives. This is extremely pluggable, and it's meant to be. 
Um, uh, network attached storage is also very useful here uh, if you're running storage. Um, if you're running storage uh, like persistent storage without a Docker volume driver, um, then you want to mount your network attached storage to varlib Docker volumes. That's where these volumes get created. Um, and we'll talk about the details of that in just a little bit. Driver API is stupid easy to implement. Um, it's uh, the docs are uh, linked to the docs is there, and, we're, and we'll hit that link again later on in the slides. Um, but essentially, it's an HTTP API that binds to a uh, binds to a, um, a, a link local, um, and and we just send commands to that, and then you broker that to your storage system. Um, mount and, and when you call a mount, you map that uh, map that uh, volume to or or directory uh, to a directory on disk, and then we'll bring that back into the container. No, you can, no, we're block two. Yeah, we don't care. As as long as um, and 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 I'll talk about the details in a minute. Um, and we we support software and hardware based storage management. It, we don't care um, NFS or SCSI. Again, we don't care. The me the mechanism for all of that is handled by your is handled by your driver. Um, so, some history about Docker volume storage. Um, it started with bind mounts. Um, people needed a couple about two years ago. The whole ephemeral container thing got old and busted and people wanted to be able to write stuff that lived after their container died. Um, so we started doing bind mounts. Uh, what that is, it just maps a directory on the host to a mount point in the container. That's it. It's, just, it's, that there's no, it's, it's, as easy as, it's as easy as that. That bind mount system is essentially the fundamental guts of mapping persistent storage to a container today. That part hasn't really changed much. It gets more complicated as to how you map it together, but essentially what has to happen is everything has to happen on the host, and then we still bind mount that into the container. Um, so uh, when the container shuts down, the data in the bind mount directory remains, um, and this is and that's a, an example of a, a, of a command line to be able to do that. Um, you just uh, add the mount command uh, or mount flag, and then tell it it's a bind mount, source target, run your container. And it's really that easy. Um, so this eventually developed into, into tempfs and also volumes. Um, tempfs is basically a, a slightly more advanced way of doing that to where you don't have to specifically mount, map a, a, direct, a, a particular um, directory on the disk. We'll just create one for you. But that's really all that is. Um, so persistent data volumes are also mapped to directories on Docker hosts. Again, they go into varlib Docker volumes. Um, so when you create, and this is again default behavior without a without a driver. So when you type Docker volume create my vol, then it's going to create. A, 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 and this is on an individual Docker host. There's no a, a, at this point we're not talking about Swarm or network aware or anything yet. Um, when you uh, it, Docker will create a directory my vol under varlib Docker volumes. And when it's mounted into a container at runtime, uh, you basically run these commands here, um, and um, and you you have two ways to do it. You can either use the dash dash mount source uh, source equal my vault destination equal slash data my container, uh, and slash data is just the target directory on the on the container. It doesn't have to be slash data. It can be wherever you want it to be, um, and or you can run dash v for volume uh, instead of dash dash mount. And then that will assume that the sort uh, that will assume that it's, it's uh, going to go into the volume system. They're essentially the same under the hood. The code path is not is not exactly the same, but they reuse a lot of stuff. Um, there's a couple of option There's a couple of option uh, um, differences for the user when if you start getting really really uh, particular into how things get uh, get mapped as, as, as you mount it. But it's really close. Yeah, what's that? If, if it's dash v, it's a volume. If it's um, and um, and if you use dash dash mount source equals and give it a volume name, yeah. it's still a volume. But in that case, the code path is slightly different in how we manage it. So if you use dash v, you have more options as, into uh, into how you're going to manage permissions and. It just uh, in this per in both examples, it'll show up in the container as slash data. But they, but they both, 
essentially, but they both work. The, it, it, in this particular case, they're both going to work identically. We, we have two different paths to do this. It's kind of confusing and annoying, but that's the way we do it. I wanted to point out that the, these are, the reason I'm pointing this out is because if you have users that do it, that, that, that like to use dash V, and you have other users that like to do dash dash mount, some of the options deeper in, deeper in are a little bit different. So now we're, so that's default behavior in Docker dealing with volumes where we create the directory for you instead of just a local by mount. Now when you get to drivers, drivers have to be installed before doing it. Uh, we have two, two different plugin specs, V1 and V2. We, both, we support both uh, right now. If you're on Linux, we highly recommend you, you build our V2, a V2 plugin. Um, the difference between a V1 and a V2 plugin, a V1 plugin, your user has to install it onto the host themselves or the admin of, uh, of, your, of the Docker installation, has to install everything on the host themselves. There's a process that's running. It's essentially a little HTTP server that's listening either on a TCP port or, um, or, or a link local socket. Um, for V2 plugins, we only allow link local sockets. Um, and, uh, but for a V2 plugin, it's also wrapped up as a container. So then you can use our container lifecycle tools to where you can say Docker plugin install uh, my driver, and it'll pull that driver in from Docker Hub and do it for you. And the user doesn't have to worry about all the details. Um, if you need to have any, if you need to have, if you need to specify um, any kind of uh, any kind of credentials, permissions, um, uh, path to the uh, um, path to the API endpoint, whatever it is that you need to do as an install, those are all available as options. That uh, you just pass those as extra variables in the command line, and they get passed through to your uh, um, to the, your container as environment variables, and then you can just read them and go. Um, and, and you can also use uh, Docker secrets for uh, uh, secret management for, um, for you know, secrets for passwords and things like that. Um, so Docker volume plugin concepts. Again, plugin runs as a container for V2 plugins. Um, I'm, I've, as usual, I jumped the gun with my slides. Sorry about that. But um, basically, your plugin binds to either a, uh, either a, a, a Unix link local socket or a TCP socket if you're running old school uh, uh, V1 plugins. And again, if you're on Windows, you have to do a V1 plugin, so you have the option of using a TCP socket if you want to. Um, it's it's only it's local it's um, local Unix sockets only uh, for V2 again. Um, process uh, the um, what happens when uh, you issue when you issue a Docker volume command and specify a driver is that uh, Docker will immediately look at that driver's um, specified endpoint, um, talk to that talk to that driver specified endpoint, and send it an API command. Um, your uh, your plugin uh, consumes that API command and then does what it needs to do, um, then sends the results back to uh, back to Docker, uh, back to the back to the Docker uh, process running on your box. Uh, the config file for uh, for the container has specifics that are, that specify your uh, resources and privileges that require on that command. It's basically it's a it's a config it's a config.json, just a JSON file with a specified uh, uh, list of stuff, um, and that's that's this file, uh, this path of this path right here. Uh, it's pretty straightforward. Um, the biggest thing, the, the biggest uh, tricky thing there is determining your uh, your kernel capabilities. Uh, and if you're familiar with that system, it's pretty easy to do. If you're not, you have to go do some digging to figure out exactly which ones you need to do. Um, and then, um, and then you got the verbs that you have to implement are right there. Um, create, remove, mount, path, unmount, get, list, and capabilities is an optional verb. It's very, very simple to implement. Um, so fundamentally, these are the links to, uh, um, to the re various resources that you need to build uh, a plugin like that. Um, the, uh, uh, in particular, the plugin helpers, a second link down there, if, you, uh, if you're comfortable writing in Go, uh, we have the Docker facing half of basically all of our plugins, um, except for locking plugins. Um, built into that uh, built into that project, so you can basically just take that and use the Docker facing half, and then implement the, your storage facing half on your side of things. Um, so what's the alternative? The alternative? Um, 
uh, just implementing the implementing the yeah you know, any language you want to run any language you want to run it's a like the if you for especially for v2 plugins it's uh, it's a container so you basically d put your runtime into the container yeah yeah um, well so it, you just it's it's an HTTP server it's an HTTP service so generally um, if, if you're running PHP you probably you may not want to implement an, uh, an HTTP service in in, in in Python you can um, you may want to you may want to use some kind of lightweight um, web service uh, to, to to bind to that to bind to your port and then answer HTTP requests and you just field uh, the results in, in your in your uh, you know, in, in your Python code, um, and we actually have, and we've got several partners that that already have Python-based implementations. Um, so, uh, the third link there is 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 our uh, is the infamous SSHFS uh, example plugin. Um, it is it is a working volume plugin um, that uses the Fuse SSHFS file system that nobody should ever run in production, um, and and it barely works in testing. And that's entirely due to the SSHFS being fragile as crap. Has nothing to do with the with the plugin itself. Um, but uh, it, it, it as, as soon as you uh, as soon as you create a volume uh, through that, if the SSH if the SSH um, uh, process dies for whatever reason, if if we get a network timeout or whatever, then you kind of have to undo and redo the whole thing. So. It's only useful as a, as a proof of concept example, and then for like I said for the um, for graph drivers, if you're really interested in doing that, um, that's uh, uh, graph uh, running containers. Uh, uh, the graph driver is definitely a critical point for performance. If you guys have a very performant um, uh, you know file system that or a very performant storage system that you think can uh, take advantage that your your customers can take advantage of and can, you can provide value. Um, graph driver is a good way to do that, and uh, but and Portworks again, that's their that's their uh, graph driver. If you want to look at an example, it's fully open source, and that's pretty much that. So um, uh, went through that in uh, um, in about a half hour. We have about twenty minutes left for uh, uh, for questions. So hit me, yes sir. Yes, yeah, those are coming. Um, it, it, it'll be a little bit before those uh, before those get added. Um, although, if you want to provide, if uh, the upstream of Docker, the Moby project, if you want to, if you want to propose, if you want to propose that, um, our engineering team is actually already considering what verbs we need to add. So, um, you know, it'll be it'll be easier for them to add it. Um, and if you want to provide some code, then and then it'll 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 speed up the, it'll speed up that process. Um, but yeah, we're the two verbs being considered right now is um, is a Docker volume update, which is kind of a generic neutral verb um, that you can then pass options to to do whatever it is that you need to do, um, and also snapshot. Those are the two verbs that we're considering right now. But if you have any other ideas or options, um, you know, we're, we're definitely willing to uh, willing to take suggestions. Yes. That's a really good question. Um, in the yeah, in the in the long run, um, you know, it's uh, like we'll in the long run we'll if we want to keep containers ephemeral, um, then we'll have to wipe. I mean, you'll have to wipe the memory uh, to make sure that you know that, to make sure that you can't uh, you know just continue to spin up a whole bunch of containers hoping hoping that you have access to some old memory. Uh, there's I mean there, there's security implications. There's also utility implications. Maybe worth Leaving uh, uh, leaving pieces of that around for uh, to make it easier to spin up copies of it. I, I don't know. Um, the uh, um, that's uh, that's something that the engineering team has looked at, but I don't I don't I haven't seen any any uh, long reports about it about anybody actually putting any deep thought on it yet. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Um, 
So my, my background, uh, I'm, a, I'm a system administrator and I work in a business development role. <laughs> so, um, the, so my responsibility for the container, uh, for the, for all of this stuff technically is I may, I actually may, I maintain the specifications for, uh, for uh, persistent volume storage. So if you're, if we have a, um, I should probably have added that link here. Let me do that real quick. So um, that particular uh, repo I, I maintain, but it's really, really, I mean, there's about 25 tests that are essentially shell scripts that exercise your plugin and make sure that the output is correct. Happy to do so. Yes. Um, use case in external and external storage in this particular case would be um, in many many cases external storage is a lot more performant than uh, than than uh, it, well especially if you're running spinning disks on uh, in in, uh, in in like converged infrastructure in, in like a, in a hyper converged box um, attached storage can be a whole lot faster um, so that's one use case just right there um, and then if it's pos if your uh, if if your attached storage has the capability to do copy on write layers built in, um, then you may be able to take advantage of that and use use some hardware acceleration to be able to make that a lot faster to manage. Yes. Um, well, that's entirely done in the plugin system. Uh, so, the so the, the question is, um, what do Kubernetes and Docker Swarm do uh, to help mounting volumes into containers? Um, that's entirely done in the plugin system. Uh, Kubernetes has a separate plugin system and a, and a separate API for managing that. Essentially, it works kind of the same way that Docker's API does. It's just a different. It's just a. Uh, a, a it's a, just a different API. Um, but basically what happens is that um, for external storage, uh, the, mount, um, uh, the mount verb uh, here uh, is uh, when Docker sends a mount command to the plugin, it's the plugin's responsibility to, uh, to grab that volume or, or that, whether it's file or block, we don't care, mount that into the host system to make that available to the container and then Docker will take that mount point, uh, take that directory on disk and then bind mount it into the container. Um, so it's basically um, so when a mount happens, um, at least in the at least on Docker side of things, uh, it's the plugin's responsibility to mount uh, to mount that volume onto the host and then report back to Docker what the mount point is on the host's file system, so that it can then be bind mounted into the container. Yep. Yes. It's it's typically just one. Um, you can you can mount multiple volumes, but it's not a very common use case. Uh, the only the only time that I would see that I th th that you might see that on a regular basis is if you have so like one of the one of the common use cases of persistent storage is um, is, is configuration data. So you've got a database and you've got a config file and you want to make sure that that config file is always the same. You put that in one volume and then you uh, and then you have your tables uh, flush to disk in another volume and you mount both of those into the container. And that's kind of and it, and, it, and and couldn't doesn't necessarily have to be a database. Any process that has to write to disk, um, that's that's typically where you would want to use two separate volumes for that. Yes. Um, no, no. The uh, the API, the HTTP API, is exactly the same. Uh, the only differences that are um, is the difference between our V1 and V2 plugin spec. Um, uh, we cannot yet containerize uh, uh, plugins uh, for Windows, and and 
Yeah, it's all V1 because the, uh, the 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 two the two limiting factors um, until very very recently, um, one of them has been um, the the uh, lack of a, a Linux local socket or a Unix local socket. Um, Microsoft is making something like that available. Um, I, I I think that's coming out in the next service pack. Um, I, I don't think it's available yet, or if it is, it's it's just recently been released. Um, and then the the other thing is just um, in the uh, config in the config JSON file for the pl- for the um, for the plugins uh, container. Um, one of the specifications you have to write down that you have to put in there is what per- what elevator permissions you need, like what devices you need to be able to access, and and what kernel capabilities you need you need elevated above a standard container, and uh, that facility just doesn't exist on Windows right now. So those and and that one we still we still can't replicate yet, and we're we're waiting on Microsoft for um, so some some uh, feature support for that. Yes. Um, we haven't, um, and one of the reasons for that is that uh, every uh, essentially uh, most of the different stores or providers, um, their uh, your performance your performance characteristics are going to be entirely different different depending on what you're plugging in as a, as a storage layer, um, and so one uh, you know one attached store store. Even though fundamentally it's it's conceptually it's the same thing, will perform entirely differently. And you do that com- compared to tuning, uh, you know, tuning the, the the storage system also may perform entirely differently depending on how it's tuned. So um, it, we have we haven't done those t- that type of testing because it's um, doesn't really have a lot of doesn't really mean a lot. Um, and, and it also depends it also depends on what your local disks are. Um, you know, if you're running uh, solid state storage in your uh, uh, on, on your local on your Docker host versus you know old you know spinning old cell spinning disks, that also makes a difference as to what the what the results are going to be. So as far as performance goes. Um, mm-hmm. Sure, absolutely. Yeah. So yeah. Well, so for hyper for in a hyper converged uh, scenario, what you're going to look for is um, if all you care about is just performance. Um, if there's you know really fast disk plugged in, that's probably the best bang for the buck for for that. But what you're not going to get is replication. Uh, you know, you're not going to get, uh, you know, you're not going to get the ability to um, to shoot a, a particular container in the head, and spin it up on a different on a different box. If you want to do that, then uh, then you're going to need some kind of way to be able to expose the same volume to multiple hosts. And uh, and in a hyper scenario, what you want to use is um, you want to use some type of software based storage solution, um, which has its own trade offs. Um, and so you want to use, you know, if you want to go the open source route, Ceph cluster, something like that. If you want, if you like, uh, you know, or, or if you just want to, you know, buy something and don't worry about, you know, what's under the hood. There's a bunch of uh, there's a bunch of storage based providers that that do that, and and a lot of them do a really good job. And I'm not trying to dodge your question, but it's it's. Um, any other questions? All right. Well, it's uh, we can get out here a little bit early then. Woohoo! <laughs> Thanks, guys.